So, uh, one of the first uh, approaches to do complete automatic modeling was a pipeline set up in Switzerland by by um, Page and, and co-workers. It started in the mid 90s, and they have a, a server called Swiss Model or something like that. So they were part of Swiss part and the Swiss Model. So they basically had they had some effort to model everything in in Unipart once or something like that. Uh, I thought it was, it was pretty stupid idea because before they finished, they, they, they had new data, so they could just do it better. So, but they, anyway, they had, they had at least, it was a good thing because they also, they, they made an automatic method that really just pushed the bottom and run. And um, so they certainly had this, they, they had some, uh, do some search and uh, do some selection template. And uh, they have to have databases behind that is up to date and sequences. And they also have a quite a lot of structure evaluation and process and assessments that they have what's quite good is they actually have qualities that are sort of uh, that, that you can tell more or less how good your model is. At least some indications of it that is bad. And, and some of these things are maybe more relevant than others. Of course you don't want the model to be completely wrong, but it, there's also, and that's most likely actually you can look at an alignment. If the alignment is good, if you have good alignment, you're most likely a good, good model. But there are also more chemical things. You don't want to have a model that have like uh, backbones that cross over each other, or atoms that collide, or rings that go into each other, things like that. So something that has more chemical checks. And, that, and these are similar to the type of checks that people do, or that, that are done when you submit the experimental structure to a database. Or you should do it yourself. So you get plots like this. So you have uh, this is your model, and you have information about uh, how long it is, what part it is. Maybe maybe you can't model the whole program, but you can model some part of it, etc. Uh, and what template was used, the sequence identity, etc., and the value. So this is a very good alignment. This is seven percent identical. But you see, you can't model the whole protein, you can only model uh, 280 to 464. But you have some alignment here, you see that basically there are no gaps in this alignment here, at least in this beginning here. And you can also see that this target starts at 175, so you could of course guess that the first half is also similar, but that's, you might, might be, no, might be, might not be, but clearly you couldn't model the first part, and you have secondary structures here both the target and your model. Yeah. So they are, of course, in this case, they're the same because they just copy the coordinates, basically. But you also have methods like uh, probability and secondary structures. You have other uh, proteins that match maybe other parts. So this is your 200 esters. You have some other proteins that are a bit short that you could have model use for model. But uh, yeah, I guess you use this one, which was 1H1R. I guess that's the first one here, I remember. And you have some uh, other data like, uh, uh, well, you could uh, choose another library, so you can actually go down and click another, another template if you want to have, etc. And you can get nice views here, have a nice view where you can look at the protein. You can look at the multiple sequence alignment, this, what is it conserved. And you have lots of reports here saying that what, what you can what you can do with it. And you can see things you get one, one, one classical method for detecting the model is good for crystallography is look at the Ramachandran plots, so these phi psi angles we talked about the other day. So you can see the phi psi angles, and if these are, they should either be up here for the beta or be here for alpha helix, or some regions here which you can be loop. If they're in other places, there are often indications that it's a bad model. Uh, and then you well, have a database, so you have a database, and you, know, you can request it. They have a repository, so all the models are made are saved there, so you can, you can search for other people's models. And we have all this data. Well, you can click it and get a nice viewer. Okay, so, the, the, so this, the model approach, the Swiss model, it's very much as I said before, it's like it's, you basically start a template, you build the lobes, stuff like that. 
There's another very popular pro pro program that is probably the most used program nowadays. It's called Modeler. And uh, do I have a battery description of it? No. I don't. Okay. Mm. So the idea of Modeler is quite different. Uh, it basically starts with the same thing, starts with alignment. But then it compares this alignment to a database of uh, pairs of protein structures. So it, for instance, can say, and then it uses this information to make some constraints. So for instance, if, if you have uh, a high sequence identity region aligned here and a high sequence identity region here, and these two are re regions are in contact in your template, what is the likelihood that these are in contact in uh, the target also? And so basically you, you can get what, what they call probability density functions. So you can say, you can basically for every proteins, uh, every two residues, so every, every, every two atoms, you can get some kind of distance, some density, probability, and some distance here, and you can get some function to discuss what is the most likely this doesn't need this residue. So, for instance, if, if you have these two residues here, and you look like that, and they are here, and this is this distance, you're most likely going to have somehow more more likely the same distance. But it also depends, of course, if these are secret similarities lower, you're going to have lower, you're going to have more variation in it. If secret similarity is high, you're going to have high variation in it. And you can also use, if you have two templates, so in your other template, if these two residues are here, and have another distance maybe over here, you could assume and say, okay, maybe it should actually be the, the average distance here that I should use. But that's most likely not the case. It's most likely you should have probably the dance function that looks like that instead. So you have it's either one or the other. So that's the observation. So you do that for every pair of basically every pair of atoms, and you also put in restraints that are from the chemical information. So you basically say that well, two residues next to each other in sequence have to be next to, next to each other. You have uh, this of secondary structure preferences and that, and that. So you have a lot of constraints. And then basically, so you put all these constraints together. So you have thousands of these. And then you try to simulate the whole folding or a folding. Use all these constraints together to make a model. So somehow it's very similar to what you do in NMR. When you have basically a lot of context, they want to be melted together. And it's using simulated annealing approach that is combined with the distance geometry approach, basically to do some kind of molecular dynamic simulation at a very high temperature and also in actually four dimensions. But uh, it's uh, so it's actually quite fast. But the, it happens sometimes that. Uh, this type of uh, error, I mean, it doesn't convert. You get something that looks completely wrong because you have the constraints are not good enough, or the the uh, uh, you have things run for long enough time, etc. But it, it is a, it, it's surprisingly fast and accurate. So it, it often takes you only a few minutes to make a model. So it's. Uh, but it requires that you have a lot of constraints, because you, otherwise you will uh, end up with something that is complete, that doesn't uh, look good. So I think in the lab, I think you use model if I remember correctly, because that's an easy way. And basically, all, all the input you give is an alignment of one sequence. The good thing, the good thing, about, one good thing about it is that it's very easy to use multiple templates, <coughs> and uh, also that is other thing is that it's fast and eff efficient. So what, what kind of errors do you normally get? What, what, what mistakes do you do? And of course, there are often small things like um, uh, you have uh, packing side chains. So still, if you have a side chain that is not part of the template, you have to put it in the right place. And in particular on the surface and in the other parts with a lot of loops and gaps, it's, that is very difficult to put it correct. It might even be flexible. 
and sometimes you have some kind of distortions and you think they're not really correct like you have loops that are a bit shifted like that and in general the loops are of course the difficult part of the line the longer loop the more different are the template they are more likely to be wrong and uh, certainly if you have an alignment mistake like in this case you should have aligned you have an alignment element there and there, and it should be a shift one step, so everything should follow this path. You're never gonna correct it. So if you use the wrong template, you might even be wrong. And it has been quite a lot of effort trying to take a model that is slightly wrong and try to improve it. And that is something that's been surprisingly difficult. So people tried at least for the last 10 years or 15 years, and uh, uh, we are pretty good at nowadays at telling how good the model is. But to use that to really guide towards better models is really, really difficult. And the last few years have been some progress, but, they, but that's by using a lot of computational, lo, lo, very, very long molecular dynamic simulations, but not just straight on running them, but also with, with particularly if you have to take molecular dynamic simulation and run it, you most likely make the model worse. So that's like that. but, but if you put in constraints, you don't let it move too much. And then you run it with a very accurate force field for some time, and you take the average structure, not, not, not the in final structure, but the average structure of your simulation, or some part of your simulation, or some subset of it, then you can actually make a small improvement of the models on that, in, in blind tests. So it's, it's, a, it's a surprisingly difficult case. <coughs> And anyway, that of course becomes where you start from, but if you start with something that is okay, but not perfect, like this type of arrows here are. I mean, wh and one reason is, of course, if, if, if you think about even the sidechain pack, probably if you had two sidechains that are packed like that, and they should be packed like that, really in a simulation, if you want to move things, you basically have to unfold it like that and move it and move it back. And most likely, well, okay, you, the program is going to make notes, you're not going to be happy here, so it's going to unfold it, but it's never going to bring it back, so you, make it, you have to make it worse. Uh, next, I will, I will tell you a little bit about the study we did some years ago, and it's not so much that you need to know the details of the study, but you, it gives you an indication on how good different methods are, or how good methods in modeling methods are in general. So we did a benchmark of different homology modeling methods, and uh, this is uh, the test set. And each line here is a different method. So you see that first you can see so there are we use the same alignments for every in every case. This are, in this case these are single template target alignments. If you look at the RMSD, so the, the distortion of the of the backbone or the alpha, you have it here, which is so if you're up to 90%, you have one Ongström, more or less. If you've done third percent identity, you know you have three Ongström. So three Ongstroms, you start having quite big changes in machines. If you look at all atoms, so they're also the side chains and everything else, it's not such a big difference here. Maybe it's four Ongstroms, but here it's already one half, two Ongstroms. So that is clear. But you can see also basically all methods are more or less following the same train. The, the sequence of identity is much more important factor than which method you use. Yes? Um, is there any reason why they have an inverted y-axis with some weird logarithm to make the yeah, no, Because we liked it. <laughs> I, uh, it's partly for us. We, we thought we, we want to have better separation. Nah, we make sure. I don't know about use one over RMSD really, but one, well, actually we have, we have there's a reason. We have, there's a scoring function we used to have it, but it's, yeah. it's probably a little bit actually really good. But it's yeah. That's, it was also to have other mesh that goes the same direction. So that we have next next plot is actually the fraction of correct side chain angles. So yeah, there was I mean, I don't know if it was a good idea, but so here basically you see that you have uh, do you look at the side chain angles, the side I so said you know maybe five side angles for the backbone. The side chain angles also can be described as the chi one and chi two angles. If you have a long side chain, you can describe them as a rotor mass around this. And so these are the fractions that you have that are Correct, so within 30 degrees of the correct ones. And here you can actually see that there is a difference. 
between uh, methods. So these methods here, actually the two top methods here, the top one there, is actually, uh, the, uh, these two methods is the same one, the blue one, the, but they are um, uh, a particular program that rebuilds all the side chains. But the difference is, is that in the top one, we keep all the same side chains the same if we can. In this case, we rebuild all of them. So if you're down here in the low sequence identity range, it doesn't really matter. But here, up here, it's much better to keep the old ones. And the other methods are just other methods that are used. But this is a significant difference. Some methods are worse than others, than, but some are better. So particularly, uh, modular is actually red methods here, which is not, are not that good in this case. While the best methods is, are, it's not called segmod and CAD. But also on the y-axis it says within set degree degrees of correct. I mean set degrees is quite a lot to consider correct, right? Yeah, but basically, if you have rotamers, that's sort of the minimums are 60 degrees away from each other. You basically have, <coughs> I mean, you can basically have six, I mean, you have trimers, but you basically have 60 degrees, or 120 degrees in between them. So that's, they are vibrating. ratings. I think it's, I don't think, I'm not sure that the ac actual accuracy even in the crystal structure is much higher than that. I mean, you have one onset structure, yes, but you don't have a three onset resolution structure, and two the accuracy is not going to be more accurate. You really can't say the rotamers that much. So uh, I don't think 30 degrees is that much. People leave you 60 degrees. But basically, often you have 120 degrees, you have three, three, three rotomers, and they're 120 degrees from each other. So that's, so that's, so 30 degrees is probably not, I mean, I don't think you can do much more higher accuracy. Because really, you can basically, but the data you have for building some sort of is basically some kind of electrical density. You have, you have a cloud here, and you have some backbone cloud here, and you're gonna build atoms in this cloud, and so this is a, and certainly you can change this angle a little bit and the rotomet can change a little bit and like that. So like you're, you're gonna have I mean it's not gonna be that exact even in even with the I mean, even with the expanded data. Unless you have a really, really expanded data where you start seeing the hydrogen levels and that. In this case is you, you can do it, but these are these number structures with this like one point five one one also structure are, are very few. Most structures are has a resolution, and it's like 2.0 angstrom or, or something like two and a half, and it's, you still build a side chain, but it's really just you just see a cloud around it, and you have to optimize it. So I don't think it's that bad, but uh, and most of the errors here are actually on the si on the surface, but you don't really have anything to build. You just point it out towards the surface, and most likely in 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 biology, in in in, in vivo, it's flexible. Uh, here, actually, we have a measure of chemistry. So we have a number of definitions of bad chemistry. So they can be bad because the five psi angles are wrong or because they overlap. So, I mean, we put a bunch of things together. And you can see particular two methods here that are this one, Yigsovo and the Builder, whatever methods are, are quite bad in this, in particular in the low sequence and entry range. The others are quite independent on sequence identity. So you can just mean that you, even if a low sequence identity model, you can build a good chemistry. The only method is, it seems to be a green method that seems to be better here with the highest sequence identity, which is in the model, model actually. That seems to be better. And it's clear this still, again, the segment NCAD seems to be a, have the lowest sequence identities, a lowest f fraction of bad models. Uh, I think it has some other problems, I don't remember what exactly. So then we tried to summarize things, like we had some some kind of uh, measure that we actually looked at. We had some criteria, the ma maximum 10% bad or missing, some of the miss, actually miss more, as you used to build up thing, I think after. So we had, we could allow max 10% of these, and we said these two methods here then was really outstandingly bad. Uh, while the other methods were for more or less the same, for slight differences. But, and also they were quite flat. I mean, this is a rough, very tough thing. They were making okay models from 40% up, but if you go down to 30%, you are getting many more bad models, all methods. So things we did for this kind of uh, 
work so basically yeah, we share, this is the kind of from data you have from statistics so you want to look at things like that are oh, the Ramachana plots you have quality and you see that even crystal structures the lower the higher the, uh, the lower resolution you have the more pa mm, residues that are in bad Ramachana models it's not because I mean it's just that you have less data so you're going to make it more worse and you have other measures like the peptide angle planarity or the mm, uh, hydrogen bond energies and that. Most of them are all kind of dependent on where you are. And this is, I guess, a case where you put in. Uh, so you can put your model in here to see if it's if something wrong. So there, there are, there are uh, like classical mistakes that are particular small side chain that, that people are doing. So th this will kind of start for us. Like we, we know that we could make good models. And then we try to make. Ask the question could, could we identify different models. Can we, I mean, how do we know if a model is good or bad more than just if knowing the answer? There's no in this case. So this is our effort to do a quality predictor. So basically we take a model and we ask how good it is. And people have tried it before and uh, afterwards also. And uh, but I think the novelty of what we did before compared to other people was that we actually looked at the quality of a model. We just said, so we had a number of models and we wanted to predict the quality. What people had did before was basically looked at the native structure and said, can we identify what is unique for native structure and compare that to some models we generate. So we want to be as close as possible to native structure. While we instead looked at a range of models and said, how good is it? Some of them are very similar to native structure, some are completely bad. So we also looked at the completely bad models. And we used, as many people use, we use a machine learning method in our network. In the latest version, we use a supported machine. But it's, the idea is very similar, it's just um, we added some more data. And we had a set of models. We had some 10,000 models or something, I think, from a set of code live bench, where there's a benchmark of homology modeling methods. And uh, we use, for all these models, all these 10,000 models or 11,000 models, we calculated the number of parameters. We took the atom-atom context, we looked what type of atoms are in context, <coughs> what type of residues are in context. And in the and surface area, what, what type of residues are found on the surface of the protein, etc. We look, we look at we look at prediction, difference in the secondary structure of the model compared to what is predicted by Cypher. Uh, we have also the difference in CL between the model and the template, if we know the template. We have some facts of fatness and fraction of models, we have some other factors that are somehow built for different things. So the key thing is that for each of these models, we have a quality measure. This was data, so of this we had two measures of quality, that is called max sub value score, that basically calculates how many residues you can find that are Overlapping if you just capture the position of them, they are normalized in different ways. And we have what we said 2,000 good models and 8,000 incorrect models, and then, um, yeah. And we built all the models by using modelers. We built 10,000 models. Because we all had basically, but one problem is, of course, that if you use different programs, you're going to make different, have different atom names, things like that. So you, you, you should be consistent with build all models with a modeler. Uh, so basically, we, even if we only had, a, so basically what we did is basically we did modular and we used modular to build full atom models. We just we used this, the proof itself as a template. So we have hundreds of things and build the model. But then we have because other proofs some some miss model miss side chains etc. Or other bad build, badly built side chains etc. And then we tested all different parameters like you always do in machine learning. So one problem here is, is like in, in, in a, from a machine learning point of view is that how do we normalize things? So if you have atom atom contents, you want to have, I mean you know what you want to have two hydrophobic atoms to be in contact, or you know that you want to have a salt pitch be formed. But how do you normalize it? Because really the network wants to have something that is like say, I mean, ideally you would like to have if I have this contact I get this score. So there are methods to do that, you can calculate, calculate the energies based on that. But what we instead did was we took something that was inspired by other people before, is that we took all contacts 
and divide them into a small group of methods and, and classifies classifies so the atoms I think we had three or thirteen. I mean then we calculated all these what fraction of all contents are, are of a certain type. And the same thing for residues. So we have trans residues types, which we have 210 different, no, 180 different uh, residue contacts. So we asked how many of these 180 uh, all contacts are alien alien contacts, etc. That, so that's, we did that, and we actually did a couple different. Uh, Defini definition is we either we use three types of atoms, so you have carbon, nil, oxygen, and nitrogen, or we use 13 types of, of contacts or atoms. So we divided carbon nil and carbon into different groups, and we I don't remember exactly which methane and something like that also, but basically, that, and then we just set put into network now network and see whatever works best, and we had some correlation here. That was just correlation between the Predictive quality and the circle quality, and also the sad score that's basically how much higher was the score for the good models compared to the bad models. So that's so we saw we in both these cases about two different measures of quality. In both cases, we got a better score using 13 atoms, so we can use 13. And for residues, we actually got the other way around. We use better to use six residue types and use six and then to use 20 residue types. So use 20. And if you combine these together, we got from 0.5 to 0.58. We get a better, better high correlation. You also noted that this measure is better than that one for making, making, making correlations, but uh, they are basically based on the same idea, just making normalization is different. And you kept on doing this, you could use add other information, you could use the uh, surface area, or uh, and you could divide it in different. Cases, or you can have some sub subgroups. You can combine it, particularly what the uh, proteins are, what amino acids are in less are buried, so less than 25 percent access to the surface. That was an important factor. But you can actually have used four different classes here. Everything was slight improvement. And then you can start combining these things together. So you see, you can go from 0.53 here to 0.76 here at the end. So we just highlight one thing on but it was quite a big jump here, 4.63 to 0.71. So this is, is what we added secondary structure information. So basically, we asked we we have the secondary structure of the model. We can calculate that using the program, and we can predict the secondary structure from the sequence. And we know that the predictions are about 65 or 70 percent correct, more or less. So for if you have an agreement, if you have, if you have uh, uh, if, if the agreement is much less than 70%, most likely it's a bad model. So what happened when we added this um, information, you can see in these plots. So this is the secondary structure agreement between the model and the predicting the secondary structure. And uh, this is the data we had before we added this information. So basically, this is what we, what we want to have. Um, this, this is just a score we predicted. So this is good models, these are bad models. And you saw that it's a big blob here. But in general, what you can see here when we add this is that if you have a low agreement, this part over here jumps down. And this part over here. So if you have, high, if you have about 7% accuracy, you're much more likely to predict a good model. So not all models with 7% uh, accuracy or agreement are good, but it's just there's more, more than money up here. Well, if you're not there, you're most likely bad. In top, so this region here, if you have only 10% agreement between the predicted secondary structure and the and the third secondary structure, you're most likely bad. So this, this, all these type of tiny types of bits of information were combined together, and at the end, you actually guess got a quite good predictor that, for this case at least, it basically predicts. In red, what parts are bad? So this is the structure. This is the mod a model, and you can call it. This is actually non. It's not even non. This is even non on residue levels. So it predicts what parts are good and bad. So in this case, we can actually predict that this model part is bad. model here, while we actually can know that this part in the middle is quite good model. So we did that. That was a later paper where we did 
the same thing for each uh, other method. And of course, and we also showed that there was better than other methods. This is the early method that was trained to predict the uh, similar model to the native structure. And then we have some measure here, and we have a number of correctly identified models, and the number of incorrect models, it's like these kind of rock curves that I talked about when we did machine learning. Not exactly the same measures, but the same idea. And our curve here was much higher than the others. This was an independent test set. And uh, well, it's the same plot again, so another, another measurement. And we also, even, even better finding the native models. So if you have some other data sets, we also were better at. We have, see, these numbers here are 2.7 and 2.6 compared to uh, lower numbers for all other methods. So different data sets for all. Well, this, all in basically every case, we had higher numbers. So this is also another example where basically some thinking, some, some, some testing and combining different parameters with some machine learning can make something that is may some type of significant improvement to, to a problem. And in this case, it's, it's, it's not a bad measure to identify if a model is correct or not. It's not perfect. There are maybe better methods. Well, particularly we have it later, Proxy 2, uh, and Bjorn has it, that is better. But um, and we have Proxy 3 even, that is a slightly better than Proxy 2. But uh, it shows also that you should check your models then, and actually it's it's a better match than to just use the um, alignment score or whatever score you get out of it. So there, there, are, there are methods that are built into this program to build them, but this is a better match. So I think in the lab, I think you will run ProQ, I think the web service will be working. So test your models. And uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs>